Hello everyone, and um, this is Gamer Ranger, the Gamer Ranger, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, thank you once again for coming back to my channel and uh, watching another one of my uh, gameplay videos. Um, so yeah, it is currently 6 in the morning. I haven't slept at all. I haven't slept a wink. And uh, I'm pretty glad about that. You know, I've got a, I've done a lot of work. And so I'm very happy about doing that myself. Doo -doo -doo. So yeah. Um, what I want to say about this game. Well, at least this particular mm, video. Um, doo -doo -doo. At the end, Jaina, fighting Jaina, was pretty hard. I had a pretty hard time actually defeating her. I had to level up a lot of my uh, minis to get her down. I have a, the video recording of when I actually do beat her, but it's saved on another... That's for another day. That will be for another day. But for now, uh, yeah, I guess for now, that's, um, that's all I got to say, really. There's not much else to do so. Um, what else, what else, what else? Oh, yeah. So I'm going to continue with the book narrations. Uh... I think that's a pretty good um, idea to do. However, this video is about an hour long, almost. And uh, reading out loud, at least for an hour, I tried that last time in my last video. And that was only for 30 minutes. And uh, it was quite vexing on the throat. And that's with me knowing how to breathe in from my diaphragm. So, yeah. So, I think I'll be doing about half an hour worth of reading. And so, I'm going to be doing that. So, for right now, where did we leave off? We left off with Michael Condley's The Dark Hours. And as far as the book goes, it's a really great book. I'm loving the book. It's very great detective work and um, I seem to be falling into that category as of lately. I'm watching Monk, I'm reading and watching the Lee Child series. Uh, both the book and the television show, which is really great. It um, it really does bring the books to life. It really does. And so, I'm going to continue where we left off with Michael Conley. I'm probably going to do... I uh, probably want to say two chapters... I'm going to aim for two chapters, but we'll see because I also don't want to mess up my throat. So anyways, Michael Conley's The Dark Hours, Chapter 3, where we left off. The Gower Gulch was the name by Hollywood Lord to the intersection on Sunset Boulevard and Gower Street where almost a hundred years ago it was picked up spot for day laborers. These laborers waited at the corner for work as extras in the westerns the movie studios were turning out by the week. Many of the Hollywood cowboys waited at the intersection, full costume, dusty boots, chaps, vest, ten-gallon hats, so it became known as the Gower Gulch. It was said that a young actor named Marion Morrison picked up work here, who was better known as John Wayne. 
The gulch was now a shopping plaza with the fading facade of an old western town and portraits of the Hollywood cowboys, from Wayne to John Autry. Hanging on the outside wall of the Rite Aid drugstore, going south from the gulch, a stretch of studio stages as big as gymnasiums lined the east side all the way down to the crown jewel of Hollywood, Paramount Studios. The storied studio was surrounded by 12 foot high walls and iron gates like a prison. But these barriers were constructed to keep people out, not in. The west side of Gower was a contradiction. It was lined with a stretch of car repair shops sharing space with aging apartment buildings where burglar bars guarded all windows and doors. The west side was marked heavily by graffiti of a local gang called Las Palmas 13. But the east side walls of the studio were left unmarred as if those with the spray paint knew by some intuition not to mess with the industry that built the city. The shooting call took Ballard and Moore to a street party in the tow yard of an auto body shop. Several people were milling about in the street, most without masks. Most were watching officers from two patrol cars who were taping off a crime scene inside the gated and asphalt paved yard, which was lined with vehicles in different stages of repair and restoration. So, we have to do this, huh? Moore said. I do, Ballard said. She opened up the door and got out of the car. She knew her answer would shame Moore into the following. Ballard was pretty sure she was going to need Moore to help with this. Ballard ducked under yellow tape stretched across the entrance to the business and quickly ascertained that the victim of the shooting was not on scene and had been transported. She saw Sergeant Dave Byron and another officer trying to corral a group of potential witnesses in one of the business's open garages. Two other uniforms were stringing an inner boundary around the actual crime scene, which was marked by a pool of blood, debris left behind by the paramedics. Ballard walked directly over to Byron. Dave, what do you have for me? She asked. Byron looked over his shoulder at her. He was masked, but she could tell by his eyes that he was smiling. Ballard, I have a shit sandwich for you, he said. She signaled him away from the citizens so they could talk privately. Folks, you all stay right here, Byron said, holding his hands up in a state position, motion to the witnesses, which Ballard took to mean that they might not understand English. He joined Ballard by the front of the rusting body of an old VW bus. He looked at what he had jotted down in a small notebook. Your victim is supposedly Javier Rafa, owner of the business, he said. Lives about a block from here. He pointed a thumb over his shoulder, indicating that the neighborhood was west of the body shop. For what it's worth, he has a known affiliation with Las Palmas, Byron added. Okay, Ballard said. Where'd they transport him? Hollywood Press. He was circling. What did they wits tell you? Not much. Left them for you. Rafa apparently has the gates open and put out on a keg every night, New Year's Eve. It's for the neighborhood, but a lot of Las Palmas shows up. After the countdown, there was some shooting of firearms into the sky. And then suddenly Rafa was on the ground. So far, nobody is saying they actually saw him get hit. And you've got shell casings all over the place. Good luck with that. Ballard shot her shin down and camera mounted on the roof, Eve over the corner of the garage. What about the cameras? She asked. The cameras outside are dummies, Byron said. Cameras inside 
are legit, but I haven't checked them. I'm told they are not in a position to be much of help. Okay, you get here before the EMTs? I didn't, but a 79 did. Finley and Watts. They said it was a head wound. They're over there and you can go talk to them. I will if I need to. Ballard checked to see if either of the uniforms who were marking the boundary was a Spanish speaker. Ballard knew basic Spanish but was not skilled enough to conduct witness inter interviews. She saw that one of the officers trying to crime scene taped to the side view mirror of an old pickup was Victor Rodriguez. You mind if I keep the V-Rod to translate? She asked. Ballard thought she, viewed, she saw the lines of a frown form on Byron's mask. How long? He asked. Preliminary with the witnesses. And then maybe the family, Ballard said. I'll get somebody from another unit if we transport any back to the station. All right, but anything else comes up, I'm going to need to pull him back out. Roger that. I'll move fast. Ballard walked over to Rodriguez, who had been with the division for about a year and after transferring from Rampart. Victor, you're with me, Ballard said. I am, he said. Let's go talk to the witness. Cool. Moore caught up with, to Ballard and stepped forward the group of witnesses. I thought you were staying in the car, Ballard said. What do you need? Moore said. I could use someone at Hollywood Press to check on the victim. You want to take the car and head over there? Shit. Or you can interview witnesses and family while I go. Give me the keys. I thought so. Keys are still in the car. Let me know what you find out. Ballard briefed Rodriguez in a whisper as they approached the witnesses. Don't lead them, she said. We just want to know what they saw, what they heard, anything they remember before they saw Mr. Rafa on the ground. Got it. They spent, they spent the next 40 minutes doing quick interviews with the collected witnesses, none of whom saw the victim get shot. In separate interviews, each described a crowded, chaotic scene in the lot during which most people were looking up at the stroke of midnight as fireworks and bullets cut through the sky. Though no one admitted it doing it themselves, they acknowledged that they were those in the neighborhood crowd who had fired guns into the air. None of these witnesses revealed anything that made them important enough to transport to the station for another round of questioning. Ballard copied their addresses and phone numbers into her notebook and told them to expect follow-up contact from homicide investigators. Ballard then signaled Finley and Watts into a huddle to ask them about first impressions of the crime. They told her the victim was non-responsive upon arrival and appeared to have been hit by a falling bullet. The wound was at the top of the head. They said they were mostly a cop occupied with crowd control, keeping people away from the victim and creating space for the paramedics. As she was wrapping up with them, Ballard got a call from Moore, who was at the Hollywood Presbyterian Medical Center. The victim's family is all here, and they're about to get the word that he didn't make it, she said. What do you want me to do? I want you to act like a trained detective, Ballard thought but didn't say. Keep the family there, she said instead. On my way. I try, Moore said. Don't try, do it, Ballard said. I'll be there in ten. Do you know if they speak English? I'm not sure. Okay, find out and text me. I'll bring somebody else in case. What's it looking like over there? Too early to tell. If it was an accident, the shooter didn't stick around. And if it wasn't, I've got no camera and no witnesses. Ballard disconnected and walked over to Rodriguez. Victor, you need to drive with me to the Hollywood press, she said. No problem. 
Ballard informed Byron of where she was going and asked him to keep the crime scene secure until she got back. As she crossed the lot following Rodriguez to his car, she saw the first drop of rain hitting the asphalt amid the bullet casings. Rodriguez used the lights, but not the siren to speed their drive to the hospital. Ballard used the minutes to call her lieutenant at home to update him. Derek Robertson Reynolds, the OIC of Hollywood Detectives, picked up immediately having texted Ballard his request for the update. Ballard, I was expecting to hear from you sooner than this. Sorry, LT. We had several witnesses to talk to before we could get a handle on this. I also just heard that our victim is DOA. Then I'll have to get the West Bureau out. I know they're already running full squad on two bagger from yesterday. Homicides were handled out of West Bureau. Robinson Reynolds was ready to pass the investigation off but knew it would not be well received by his counterparts at West Bureau Homicide. Sir, you can do that, of course, but I haven't determined what this is yet. There were a lot of people shooting guns at midnight. Not sure if this was accidental or intentional. I'm heading to the hospital now to get a look at him. Well, did any of the witnesses see it? Not the witnesses who stuck around. They just saw the victim on the ground. Anybody who saw it happened scrammed out of there before the units got on scene. There was a pause as the lieutenant considered his next move. They were a block from the hospital. Ballard spoke before Robinson Reynolds responded. Let me run with LT. Robinson Reynolds remained silent. Ballard made her case. West Bureau is running out on the two-bagger. We don't even know what this is yet. Let me stay with it, and we'll see where it stands in the morning. I'll call you then. The lieutenant finally spoke. I don't know, Ballard. Not sure I want you capering out there on your own. I'm not alone. I'm with Lisa Moore, remember? Right, right. Nothing on that tonight? He was asking about the midnight men. Not so far. We're pulling into the Hollywood press now. The family of the victim is here. It pushed Robinson Reynolds to make a decision. Okay, I'll hold off on the West Bureau for now. Keep me informed, no matter the hour, Ballard. Roger that. Okay, then. Robinson Reynolds disconnected. Ballard's phone buzzed with a text as Rodriguez was pulling to a stop behind Ballard's car which had been left by Muir in an ambulance bay. Was that Dash? Rodriguez asked. What did he say? He was using the short name ascribed to Robinson Reynolds by most in the division when not addressing the lieutenant personally. Ballard checked the text. It had come from Muir. No English spoken here. He gave us the green light, Ballard said. Us? Rodriguez said. I'm probably going to need you in here too. Sergeant Byron told me to double time back. Sergeant Byron is now in charge of the investigation. I am. And you're with me until I say otherwise. No, oh, Roger that. As long as you tell him, I will. Ballard found Muir in the ER waiting room, surrounded by a group of crying women and one teenage boy. Rafa's family had just gotten the bad news about their husband and father, a wife, three adult daughters, and a son were all exhibiting various degrees of shock, grief, and anger. Oh boy, Rodriguez said as they approached. 
nobody liked intruding on the kind of trauma unexpected death brings. I heard you want to be a detective someday, V-Rod, Ballard asked. Fuck yeah, Rodriguez responded. Okay, I want you to help Detective Moore interview the family. Do more than translate, ask the questions. Any known enemies, his association with Las Palmas. Who else was at the shop tonight? Get names. Okay, what about you? Where are? I need to check the body. Then I'll be joining you. Got it. Good. Let Detective Moore know. Ballard split off from him and went to check and counter. Soon, she was led back to the nursing station that was in the middle of the ER. It was surrounded by multiple examination and treatment spaces separated by curtain walls. She asked a nurse if the body of the gunshot victim had been moved yet from a treatment space and was told that the hospital was waiting for a coroner's team to pick it up. The nurse pointed her to a closed curtain. Ballard pulled back the pasteel green curtain, entered the single bed examination space, and then closed the curtain behind her. Javier Rafa's body was face up on bed. There had been no attempt to cover him. His shirt, a blue work shirt with his name on an oval patch, was open and his chest still showed conduent ointment, likely from the paddles that had been used in an attempt to revive him. There were also widest discoloration on the brown skin of his chest and neck. His eyes were open and there was a rubber device extending from the mouth. Ballard knew it that had been placed in his mouth before the paddles were used. Ballard pulled a pair of black latex gloves out of a compartment on her equipment belt and stretched them on. Using both hands, she gently turned the dead man's head to look for the entry wound. His hair was long and curly, but she found the entry at the upper rear of his head under hair matted by blood. Judging from its location, she doubted that there was an exit wound. The bullet was still inside, which in terms of her insects was a break. She leaned farther over the bed to look closely at the wound. She guessed that it had been made by a smaller caliber bullet and that noticed that some of the hair had around it was singed. It meant that the weapon had been held less than a foot away when discharged. She saw specks of burnt gunpowder in Javier Rafa's hair. In that moment, Ballard knew this had been no accident. Rafa had been murdered. A killer had used the moment when all eyes were cast upon upward to the midnight sky and there was a gunfire all around to hold a gun close to Rafa's head and pull the trigger. And in that moment, Ballard knew she wanted the case, that she would find a way to keep this conclusion to herself until she was too deeply embedded to be removed. She knew this could be the solve she needed to save herself. Chapter 5 Ballard pulled the curtain closed after stepping out of the treatment bay and walked over to the nursing station so she would not block traffic in the busy ER. She took out her phone and called the number for the Hollywood Division gang enforcement detail. No one picked up, so then called the inside line in the watch office. Sergeant Kyle Dallas answered and Ballard asked him who was working second 12s from GED. That would be Jason and Cordero, Dallas said, 
And I think Sergeant Davenport is around too. Out or in? Ballard asked. I just saw Cordero in the break room, so I guess they might have all come in now that the watching hour is past. Okay, when we see them, tell them to stay put. I need to talk to them. I'll be in soon. You got it. Ballard went through the automatic doors to the waiting room and saw Moore and Rodriguez sitting in a corner with the Rafa family in a group interview. Rene was annoyed that Moore had not conducted individual interviews, but then she remembered herself that Moore was used to investigating sexual assaults, which usually involved solo interviews of victims. Muir was out of her league here, and Rodriguez just didn't know any better. Ballard saw that the son was sitting outside the huddle and looking over the shoulder of two of his sisters at home at Moor. He was young enough to still be in school, which meant he might speak English. Moor should have known this. She walked up and tapped him on the shoulder. Do you speak English? She whispered. The boy nodded. Come with me, please, Ballard said. She led him over to another corner. The waiting, the waiting room was surprisingly uncrowded. Surprising for any night of the week, but particularly for post-midnight on New Year's Eve. She pointed to a chair for the boy to take and then pulled a second chair away from the wall and positioned it so they could talk face to face. They both sat down. What's your name? Ballard asked. Gabriel, the boy said. You are Javier's son? Yes. I'm sorry for your loss. We're going to have to find out what happened and who did it. I'm Detective Ballard. You could call me Renee. Gabriel eyed her uniform. Detective? he asked. We had to be in uniform for New Year's Eve, Ballard said. Everybody out on the street, that sort of thing. How old are you? Fifteen. What school do you go to? Hollywood. And you were at the shop toes yard tonight at midnight? Yes. Were you with your father? Uh, no, I was over by the caddy. While at the crime scene, Ballard has seen a rusting old Cadillac parked in the lot. Its trunk was open and there was beer keg sitting in a bed of ice inside it. Were you with anyone by the caddy? Ballard asked. My girlfriend, Gabriel said. What's her name? I don't want to get her in trouble or, or nothing. She's not in trouble. We're just trying to figure out who was there tonight, that's all. Ballard waited. Lara Rosas, Gabriel finally said. Thank you, Gabriel, Ballard said. Do you know Lara from school or the neighborhood? Uh, both. And she went home? Yeah. She left when we came here. Did you see what happened to your father? No, I just saw him after. Him lying there. Gabriel was exhibiting no emotion and Ballard saw no tear lines on his face. She knew this meant something. Or nothing. Most likely nothing. People process and express shock and grief in different ways. Unusual behavior or a lack of obvious emotion should not be considered suspicious. Did you see anybody at the party that you thought was strange or didn't belong? Ballard asked. Not really, Gabriel said. There was a guy there at the keg who didn't look like he belonged, but it was a street party. Who knows? Was he asked to leave? No, he was just there. He got his beer and then I guess he left. I didn't see him no more. Was he from the neighborhood? I doubt it. I never saw him before. What makes you say that he didn't look like he belonged? Well, he was a white guy. Plus, he seemed kind of dirty. You know, his clothes and stuff. 
You think he was homeless? I don't know. Maybe. That's what I thought. And this was before the shooting that you saw him? Yeah, before. Definitely. It was before everyone started looking up. You said his clothes were dirty? What was he wearing? Uh, a gray hoodie and blue jeans. His pants were dirty. Was it dirt or grease? Uh, like dirt, I think. Was the hoodie up or down? Could you see his hair? It was up, but it would kind of look like he had a shaved head. Okay, what about his shoes? Do you remember them? Nah, I don't know about his shoes. Ballard paused and tried to commit the details of the stranger to memory. She was not writing anything down. She thought it would be better to maintain eye contact with Gabriel and not possibly spook him by taking out a notebook and pen. Who else did you notice who wasn't there? Who wasn't right? She asked. Nobody else, Gabriel said. And you're not sure if the guy in the hoodie hung around after getting his beer? I didn't see him again. So, when you last saw him, how long was that before midnight and all the shooting started? I don't know, a half hour? Did you see anybody like your dad ask him what he was doing there or ask him to leave? No, because it was like a block party. Everybody welcome. Did you see any other white people at the party? A few, yeah. But they weren't suspicious. No. But this other guy was. Well, it was like a party and he was dirty. And he had the hoodie up, you know? Your father had a work shirt on. Was that usual? Because it had his name on it. He wanted all the neighbors to know who he was. He always did that. Ballard nodded. It was now time to ask more difficult questions and hold this kid to her side as long as she could. Did you fire any weapons tonight, Gabriel? She asked. No, no way, Gabriel said. Okay, good. Are you associated with Las Palmas 13? What are you asking me? I'm no gangster. My dad said no way. Hey, don't get upset. I'm just trying to figure out what's what. You're not associated. That's good. But your father was, right? He quit that shit a long time ago. He was totally legit. Okay, that's good to know. But I heard these. They were guys from Las Palmas in the shop yard for the party. Is that true? I don't know, maybe. My father grew up with these people. He didn't just throw them in the trash, but he was legit. His business was legit. He even had a white man as his partner. So don't go starting no shit about gang related. That's bullshit. Ballard nodded. Good to know, Gabriel. Can you tell me, was his partner there? I didn't see him. Are we done here? No, not yet, Gabriel. What's the partner's name? I don't know. He's a doctor in Malibu or some shit. I only saw him once when he came in with a bent frame. A bent frame? His Mercedes. He backed into something and bent the frame. Got it. Okay. I need two more things from you, Gabriel. What? I need your girlfriend's phone number and I need you to step outside to my car for a minute. Why should I go with you? I don't want to see my father. They're not going to let you see your father, Gabriel. Not until later. I want to help you. I want this to be the last time you have to talk to the police about this. But to do that, I need to wipe your hands to make sure you're telling the truth. What? You say you didn't fire a gun tonight. I wipe your hands with something I have in my car and will know for sure. After that, you only hear from me when I come to tell you we caught the person who did this to your father. Ballard waited while Gabriel considered the options. If you won't do it, I have to assume you lied to me. You don't want that, do you? All right, whatever. Let's do it. 
Ballard walked over to the group first to ask Moore for the car keys. Moore said that they were in the car. She then led Gabriel out to the ambulance base. Here, she pulled a notebook out of her back pocket. After writing down the cell phone number for Gabriel's girl, she jotted down his description of the man in the hoodie. She then opened her car's trunk. She took out a packet of white pads for gunshot residue testing, used separate pads to wipe both Gabriel's hands, then sealed them in a plastic bag to be submitted to the lab. See? No gunpowder, right? Gabriel said. Mm, the lab will confirm that, Ballard said. But I already believe you, Gabriel. So what do I do now? You go in and be with your mother and your sisters. They're going to need you to be strong for them. Gabriel nodded and his face contorted. It was as though telling him to be strong had kicked his strength out from beneath him. You okay? Ballard asked. She touched his shoulder. You're going to catch this guy, right? He said, yeah. Ballard said, we're going to catch him. Okay, and I think I uh, will be stopping there for today. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you for watching and thank you for listening. I'm going to let the video keep playing. And of course, at the end of my speech or narration, whatever, I'm going to give you the three, two, one volume change, as always. Um, so yeah. Let me know what you guys think in the comments, what you want to hear, what you want to listen to, what you want to see more of. If you like, like. If you like, subscribe. If you like, share. And as always, thank you very much. Oh, and uh, as a PS as well, um, I think because I do a lot. I mean, I, I play these games every day and uh, each game for at least an hour or something. So I don't know. I don't think at least I can narrate a book for that long and for so many videos and every day. I don't think you people, whoever's watching, would want to see that unless specified of course unless you write something down in the comments <laughs> uh but seriously um i think at least at least for warcraft rumble because i could i could separate those into 30 minute segments either twice a day or i don't know I, once a day, most likely, probably, play half an hour, do my dailies, and that's it. Um, and as far as Diablo Immortal, since the uh, music is quite calming and soothing, especially in, uh, in town, I think I could just leave it as ambiance, just as background music, background background noise um so yeah i will be doing stuff on there mainly it will be my uh dailies of course i'm always going to be doing dailies but like i also said from the very beginning i will be this will be semi-casual i do um i have been getting better at my um at my necromancer in diablo immortal and i have been getting better way better in my uh, warcraft rumble uh, especially in pvp i'm starting to do a lot more pvp in warcraft uh with a uh, shifting oh man i don't know why i didn't you know in pvp you always always want to be in control so that means a lot of stuns, 
a lot of days, a lot of fear. And I don't know why I didn't do this, but he has a stun, a, uh, a stun that he keeps stunning like every second or something. So anyways, to end the video, um, Warcraft Rumble gameplay with story book narration and Diablo Immortal for ambiance, background music, background noise. For those who are more of the solace in solitude kind of lifestyle. But anyways, as always, thank you very much for visiting and have a good day. I forgot uh, volume change. Three, two, one. Resorting to violence. Oh, hello there. Yeah! 
Resorting to violence. Oh, hello there.
resorting to violence. Oh, hello there. Resorting to violence. 